Number 15. American Tourist vs. Kangaroo During a visit to a Perth wildlife park in 2023, an American man saw a kangaroo harassing a woman and child. He bravely, or perhaps foolishly, stepped in between the offending creature and the targeted pair, and the next thing he knew, he had become the focus of the kangaroo's rage. Footage captured by an onlooker showed the animal standing on its hind legs and repeatedly throwing punches at the man, who was now the one in need of a bystander's help. As he tried to restrain the kangaroo by extending his arm, another man came over and attempted to calm the animal down. It worked, but their success was short-lived. The men kept trying to walk away from the marsupial, who continued to follow and attack them. When they held the kangaroo by its arm, it began kicking them with its much stronger back legs. The chaos went on for two minutes before a park employee appeared and scolded the creature, who immediately obeyed her and left the visitors alone. Because nobody was seriously injured by the small to mid-sized western grey kangaroo, it was easy for people to laugh at the footage, but many commenters were quick to remark on how much worse the situation could have turned out if the man encountered a larger red kangaroo. Number 14. Redback Spider Bite Leads to Years-Long Suffering 28-year-old volunteer firefighter Jenna Allen was getting ready to go on a call in Donald, Victoria in November 2014 when she noticed what she thought was a harmless bug on her arm. She brushed it away, but not before it bit her. Almost instantly, she was struck by a spreading pain in her arm and overwhelmed by a sick feeling that took over her whole body. Within minutes, her arm was covered in bumps, her head was throbbing, and she was experiencing stabbing stomach pains. The bug that bit her happened to be a venomous redback spider. Jenna's local hospital didn't have the proper anti-venom, so she was transferred to another hospital an hour's drive away. Doctors gave her anti-venom, dressed her arm wound, and administered antibiotics, but the wound turned necrotic, which means that the tissue was dead and the infection was spreading. The young woman underwent a skin graft using skin from her thigh, and her arm improved over the next year, only for the infection to return with a vengeance. Left with no other choice, Jenna paid $1,300 per week for specialist dressings that contained strong medication. She bounced between doctors who struggled to figure out why her infection was so difficult to treat. After finally finding a doctor who suspected that her body was rejecting her skin graft, she spent three months in a burn unit. Some progress was made, but the pain and symptoms continued, and in 2020, Jenna learned that she might need an amputation. As of September 2023, she was still trying to save her arm by continuing her intensive and costly treatments. Number 13. Road Trip Attack 20-year-old Geordie Honor was just 105 miles into her road trip along the West Australia coast in early 2022 when she noticed a man in a white SUV following her. She knew it wasn't just her imagination when she stopped at a convenience store and a vehicle also pulled into the lot. The driver remained in the car while Geordie went inside, and when she left, he trailed right behind her. After driving for a few more miles, the young woman pulled into a parking bay. The man approached her and repeatedly asked for her phone number. When she refused to give it to him, he lunged at her and choked her. Jordi tried to grab a knife to fight back with, but she quickly fell unconscious and woke up hours later to a truck driver pouring water on her face. She had been brutally beaten and left for dead beneath her vehicle. Geordie drove herself to the hospital, where she received treatment for injuries to her eye, jaw, ribs, and pelvis. She told Nine News that she wonders if her attacker thought he killed her. The suspect is still at large. Number 12. The Murder of Tatiana Dokotaru 28-year-old Danny Zayat was facing nearly two dozen domestic-related criminal charges when his estranged wife, 34-year-old Canadian national Tatiana Dokotaru, was found murdered in her Sydney apartment in May of 2023. She had called emergency services the night before and said her husband was assaulting her and demanding money, but the call abruptly ended before Tatiana could provide an address. The matter was classified as non-urgent, so it took police three hours to respond. There were several different addresses for Tatiana listed in their database, and unfortunately law enforcement did not find her until a concerned neighbor called and directed them to her apartment 20 hours after the first emergency call had come in. The victim's turbulent history with Danny Zayat made him an instant person of interest to police. At the time, the charges he was facing for previous domestic incidents included choking without consent, violating an anti-violence order, assault, 
and destroying or damaging property. Danny reportedly admitted to police that he and Tatiana had argued on the night of her death, claiming his ex was on drugs at the time. He denied having any involvement in her death, but to investigators, all signs pointed toward him being the killer. In September 2023, three months after Tatiana's death, authorities charged Danny with murder. Authorities claim that Danny threw Tatiana's phone off the balcony of her 22nd floor apartment while she was on the phone with the emergency dispatcher. He allegedly proceeded to beat the victim to death, and Tatiana's phone has never been found, much to the disappointment of detectives who believe it could contain information imperative to the case. According to the most recent updates, the investigation is ongoing as Danny Zayat waits to face his day in court. Number 11. The Murder of Nelomi Pereira In a heartbreaking act of desperation that was captured on camera in December 2022, a hysterical teenager banged on her neighbor's door in the middle of the night and begged for help. Her mother, 43-year-old Nelomi Pereira, was being stabbed inside their home in the Melbourne suburb of Sandhurst. The young woman had escaped, but her brother was still in the house. In the video, she could be heard saying that she was pretty sure her mother was dead. Unfortunately, she was right. After answering the door, the neighbor rushed over to the house where he found Nalomi dead. The woman's son was suffering from stab wounds but had survived the attack. He was rushed to the hospital while Nalomi's husband, 45-year-old Dinush Carrera, was arrested at the scene on suspicion of murder. According to neighbors, Nalomi had recently separated from Dinush and changed the locks on her home. Dinush pleaded not guilty and the case appears to be ongoing. Number 10. The Murder of Lily James in October 2023, 21-year-old Lily James was beaten to death with a claw hammer in the gymnasium bathroom of the school where she worked in Sydney. She was murdered by her 24-year-old co-worker, Paul Tierson, a Dutch national whom she had reportedly dated for five weeks before ending the relationship just days before her death. After killing Lily in cold blood around 7 o'clock p.m. as she returned some sports equipment to the school, Tierson allegedly texted the young woman's father from her cell phone, asking him to pick her up. Tierson then drove over an hour to Vaucluse, where he alerted the police to the crime and met his own end at the bottom of a cliff. His body was recovered from the water, and the murder weapon was found in a trash bin nearby. Lily worked at the school part-time as a water polo instructor while pursuing a business degree. During her brief relationship with Tierson, he allegedly bragged to his students about dating her. Speaking with the Daily Mail, renowned criminologist Tim Watson Monroe speculated that Tierson is a merciless sociopath and narcissist with possessive and jealous tendencies. Watson Monroe described Tierson's final act of calling the police and then making sure they wouldn't find him alive as a taunting gesture toward law enforcement, indicating that until the very end, he obsessed over controlling the situation. The disturbing tragedy is prompting increased calls among activists for better protection against abusers who kill their former partner for daring to leave them. Number 9. The Disappearance of Paddy Moriarty 70-year-old Paddy Moriarty and his dog Kelly lived in the remote northern Australian town of Larimer, which is home to just a dozen or so residents, most of whom are senior citizens. On a December evening in 2017, Paddy and Kelly left the local pub and were never seen again. According to police, the two went home, where Paddy put a leftover chicken in the microwave that a fellow customer had given to him for Kelly. Their trail ends there. With no body and very little evidence to go on, the case quickly went cold. Authorities believe Paddy is dead, but they've been unable to prove it. An ongoing feud between Paddy and his neighbor, Fran Hodgetts, has been a centerpiece of the investigation since early on in the case. According to the Washington Post, Hodgetts accused Paddy of poisoning her plants, throwing dead kangaroos on her property, and stealing her belongings. Detectives questioned Fran's live-in gardener, Owen Laurie, who denied having any knowledge of or involvement in Paddy's disappearance. He claimed he was too weak from osteoporosis to have killed Fran's missing neighbor, but was secretly recorded making incriminating statements about the case on several occasions. In the recordings, which were captured shortly after Paddy's disappearance in early 2018, Laurie allegedly talked about killing Paddy with a claw hammer. He denied being the person talking in at least two of the clips and refused to answer any further questions during an inquest hearing in 2022. 
By then, a witness had come forward with claims that they had overheard Hodgetts discussing a plan to have someone murdered shortly before Paddy went missing. Hodgetts admitted that she deeply disliked her neighbor and that she had even probably talked about killing him in a distasteful way, but that the comments were made in jest and that she never had any actual plans to kill someone. Investigators still suspect that Laurie or someone else killed Paddy on Hodgetts' behalf as the feud between the warring neighbors escalated. Number 8. The Murder of Scott Johnson In December 1988, the naked, lifeless body of 27-year-old American mathematician Scott Johnson was found at the base of a 200-foot cliff in northern Sydney. His neatly folded clothes and other belongings were found on top of the cliff. Scott's death was ruled as self-inflicted, but his family strongly believed he had met with foul play, especially since he would have had no reason to remove his clothing if his plan was to jump to his demise. Scott had moved to Australia from the United States to pursue his PhD and to live with his partner, Michael Noon. His death came amid a spate of dozens of murders of gay men in the area, many of whom were pushed off cliffs, and the specific cliff that he was found near was a popular meeting spot for members of the gay community at the time. Despite the suspicious circumstances, authorities refused the Johnson family's repeated attempts to get the case reopened. Finally, in 2012, a coroner's inquiry changed Scott's cause of death to unexplained. A subsequent inquiry in 2017 ruled that he was most likely murdered in an anti-gay attack. But the case remained a true whodunit, prompting Scott's father and law enforcement to offer a combined $2 million reward for information leading to the arrest of a suspect. In 2020, the ex-wife of a 52-year-old man named Scott White implicated her former husband in Johnson's death. During a subsequent investigation, an undercover detective befriended White and recorded him admitting to Scott's murder, leading to his arrest for the crime. According to the narrative put forth by prosecutors, White and Johnson met at a pub on the night of the murder. They took a walk together to the cliff and got into an argument. White, who was 18 years old at the time, punched Johnson, who stumbled backwards and fell off the cliff. Instead of trying to get help, White left Johnson there to die. White initially pleaded guilty to murder and received a 12-year prison sentence, but he changed his mind about his plea and got the conviction overturned. He pleaded guilty to a reduced manslaughter charge in 2023 and was sentenced to nine years in prison with the requirement to serve at least six years behind bars before being considered for parole. Number 7. Frog Mucus Ritual Deaths Using poisonous frog mucus to detoxify the body is an age-old ritual among some cultures. In recent years, it's also become increasingly popular among alternative therapy enthusiasts, despite having no proven medicinal benefits. Known as cambo or sapo, the mucus is scraped off the backs of live giant monkey frogs who secrete the substance as a protection against predators. According to BBC News, participants of a cambo ceremony drink a liter of water before creating small burns on their skin and rubbing the mucus into the wounds. It causes a person's blood pressure to rise while they vomit and or defecate profusely for up to 30 minutes. As unpleasant as this sounds, cambo users believe it promotes mental clarity and treats certain ailments by ridding the body of toxins, but it can also cause heart attacks, seizures, liver failure, and death. In 2019, 39-year-old Natasha Lechner turned to cambo as an alternative treatment to back pain she suffered from due to obesity. She trained as a cambo practitioner but was apparently unaware of the hazards it poses. Within moments of applying the substance during ritual at her home in northern New South Wales, she fell unconscious. She was in the company of a fellow Cambo practitioner who attempted to perform CPR but failed to call for help. At least 10 minutes passed before Natasha's roommate arrived home and summoned emergency responders to the residence after noticing that her mouth was foaming. Another disturbing Cambo-related death occurred in October 2021 when 46-year-old Jared Antonovich took Cambo during a six-day retreat. He had suffered from the effects of a brain injury after getting into a car accident 20 years earlier, which left him with movement and speech difficulties. According to the findings of a coroner's inquest, Jared was visibly unwell after taking Cambo. Within nine to ten hours of the ceremony, he could no longer walk on his own, and his face and neck were extremely swollen. 
It didn't help that he had also reportedly taken ayahuasca, a strong hallucinogen that often causes severe vomiting. At some point, Jared became unresponsive, prompting someone to call an ambulance. Paramedics later told investigators that the ceremony continued while they tended to Jared and that some of the attendees were annoyed by their presence. One person even allegedly tried to stop the emergency responders from treating Jared, claiming they were interfering with his aura. Unaware that Jared had used Cambo or ayahuasca, the paramedics thought he was having a panic attack, only to later learn that his esophagus had ruptured. The deaths of Natasha Lechner and Jared Antonovich prompted authorities to take a closer look at what's driving people to resort to Cambo use and whether these types of deaths are preventable. Under Australian law, Cambo falls under the highest danger classification for poisons. It was outlawed in 2021, but some experts have suggested that decriminalizing it would better enable authorities to better regulate it. As the alternative medicine scene continues to grow, it's one of the debates that have landed on the discussion table in an effort to determine what approach will be the most effective in keeping people safe. Number 6. The Murder of Omega Rustin on Australia Day in January 2009, a 32-year-old father of two and construction worker named Omega Rustin was shot dead in an apparent road rage incident on the Gold Coast while leaving a party with two friends. According to police, he became angry when a maroon sedan cut his vehicle off in traffic. Rustin argued with the group of men in the car, then confronted them again outside a McDonald's in Burley Heads, where someone fired the fatal shots from the rear passenger side window. The case quickly went cold, and it remained that way for 13 years. Arrests finally came in early 2022, following a tip that police received amid a nude effort to solve the case. 37-year-old Paul Yunan, 39-year-old Tony Elbaya, and 43-year-old Haysam Hamdan are all facing murder charges, while former bandido biker gang enforcer Brent Simpson is charged with being an accessory after the fact. Paul Yunan is accused of being the shooter, but was nevertheless granted bail several months after his arrest. Haysom Hamdan, who was arrested while attempting to board a plane to Dubai with $25,000 cash in his possession, was also granted bail. The public was especially shocked by the arrest of 45-year-old ex-bandido Brent Simpson, who ran a popular podcast under the cleaned-up image of himself as a reformed former gangster. He was granted bail a few months after his arrest, and the cases against the suspects appear to be ongoing. Number 5. The Rack Man during an early morning fishing trip along the Hawkesbury River in Sydney in August 1994, the crew of a boat called the Lady Marion discovered the dead body of a man attached to a steel cross and wrapped in plastic. He had a noose around his neck and wire wrapped around his torso and arms, securing him to the cross, which appeared to be custom-built to the victim's measurements. A coroner ruled that he died from blunt force injuries, but it was unclear whether the man was tied to the cross when he was killed. Dubbed the Rack Man, the victim was thought to have been murdered up to two years earlier. His fingerprints had worn away from decomposition, making identification impossible in an era when DNA was in its infancy. The crucifix he was attached to appeared to be fashioned by a skilled welder, and the apparatus was too heavy for one person to have disposed of the body on their own, indicating that several suspects were involved. Authorities offered a $100,000 reward for information and released a facial reconstruction of what the rack man might have looked like, but the man's identity remained elusive for nearly a quarter century. In 2018, officials announced that the rack man had been identified as Max Tanchevsky, a habitual gambler who was 37 years old when he disappeared. He was last seen leaving his home in January 1993 in Newtown, Sydney by his partner, who initially didn't suspect anything was wrong due to his tendency to travel up and down the Gold Coast during his gambling sprees. While it's common for gamblers to get mixed up with shady underworld figures, Tanchevsky had no known ties of this nature. He also didn't appear to be in the kind of debt that can get a gambler killed, leaving the reason for his murder unclear. And as far as suspects go, investigators remain empty-handed. Number 4. The Murder of Irma Palasics 
Around 9.30 p.m. one night in November 1999, two men invaded the home of Irma and Gregor Palasics in the Canberra suburb of McKellar. The intruders bound the elderly couple with zip ties, duct tape, and telephone cords and brutally assaulted them before ransacking the house. After the suspects left, Gregor managed to free himself and call for help, but by the time emergency responders arrived, 73-year-old Irma had died from her injuries. The Palasics had been the victims of two prior burglaries at their previous home in 1997 and 1998. During the first robbery, the intruders made off with valuable coins and jewelry, along with over $100,000 in cash. During the second incident, Irma was assaulted by two masked thieves. She fought back and managed to pull the mask off one of the perpetrators before they fled the scene. Investigators followed numerous leads over the next 24 years, only to hit one dead end after another. In late 2014, authorities announced major developments in the case, including a possible DNA link between Irma's killers and more recent break-ins at local businesses. They released surveillance footage of several persons of interest, along with a DNA phototyping image of what one of the killers might have looked like, but the information failed to yield any breakthrough tips like investigators were hoping to receive. In September 2023, officials announced the arrest of 68-year-old Steve Fabrizi, who turned up as a match to DNA evidence left behind at the crime scene. He allegedly admitted to burglarizing the Palasic's home, but denied murdering Irma. Two months later, authorities charged accused co-conspirator 68-year-old Josef Faconi with murder. Both defendants remain in custody as they await their next court hearing, which is scheduled for early 2024. Number 3. The Somerton Man in December 1948, a dead middle-aged man was found slumped against a seawall at a beach in the Adelaide suburb of Somerton. He was wearing a suit but had no ID or anything else to indicate who he was. All his clothing tags had been removed, and the few objects found in his pocket posed more questions than answers. The contents consisted of two bus tickets and a scrap of paper containing the Persian phrase Tamam Shud, which translates to finish or it is ended. Police published the man's photo, but nobody was able to identify him, marking the beginning of Australia's most famous John Doe case. In the absence of a known real name, he became known as the Somerton Man. Witnesses who had seen him the night before told police that he seemed weak and disoriented. Assuming he was a drunk bum, they left him on his own to sort out his issues. He was last seen in the exact same place where he was found dead hours later. Based on his clean-cut appearance, athletic build, and professional attire, investigators didn't believe he was a transient, but they were at a loss to explain who he was or where he came from. The Somerton man's cause of death was a mystery. He bore no outward signs of trauma, and while blood in his stomach suggested that he may have been poisoned, toxicology tests failed to yield any signs of this being the case. The Salvation Army buried him and provided him with a headstone calling him the Unknown Man. Further investigation revealed that the Tamam Shud paper found in the man's pocket had been ripped out of the back of a Persian poetry book called The Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Law enforcement appealed to the public for copies of the book that were missing the back page, and to their surprise, a man turned over the requested item, which he said someone had thrown into the open window of his car. On the inside of the back cover, someone had written two phone numbers and a series of letters thought to be a code, leading to speculation that the Somerton man was a foreign spy. One of the phone numbers written in the book belonged to a woman who admitted to giving a copy of the book to a military service member years before, but the recipient was still alive. She denied knowing the dead man, but allegedly became visibly startled when shown a photograph of him. Over the years, investigators were repeatedly disappointed by several leads that had seemed promising. The Somerton man's identity was still unknown when a team led by electrical engineer Derek Abbott began dedicating their spare time to solving the mystery. DNA from strands of hair found on his death mask finally led to a breakthrough in 2022, more than 70 years after the man was found dead on the beach. Based on the findings, Abbott announced that he was 99.9% .9 certain the Somerton man is Carl Charles Webb. He was born in 1905, grew up outside Melbourne, went to college, and was an electrical technician who worked at a factory for much of his adult life. By all appearances, Webb lived an ordinary life until 1947, when he separated from his wife. 
When Dorothy Robertson divorced Webb on grounds of abandonment, staff at his workplace confirmed that he had quit his job the same year the couple split up. Little else is known about Webb, whose living relatives don't remember him. Authorities exhumed the body for official DNA testing, but have yet to confirm the Somerton man's identity, and some experts vehemently disagree with Abbott's identification of the man as Charles Webb. In 2023, a former lawyer named Sophie Holzman came forward with her suspicions that he was actually a European communist and spy named Josef Halben. She claimed that high levels of strontium-90 were found in the Somerton man's hair, indicating that he had traveled overseas and had some sort of involvement with atomic weapons testing. If it's true, then it would be impossible for the Somerton man to be Webb, who never traveled internationally. For now, the mystery endures as authorities remain tight-lipped on their own findings and beliefs about the man's identity. Number 2. The Murders of Ian Stewart Hogg and Frederick Rosson 45-year-old liquor store manager Ian Stewart Hogg was last seen pulling into the parking lot of his Gold Coast apartment building in the city of Corumban in March 2002. He talked to his mom on the phone at 6 o'clock in the evening and hasn't been seen or heard from since. Hogg's red Toyota Celica was found abandoned the next day in the nearby town of Tweed Heads. It disappeared shortly thereafter, eventually leading investigators to believe it was stolen. Four days after Ian went missing, 67-year-old Frederick Hugh Rosson, who also went by the name Charles Slim Johnson, was shot dead at his property in Mount Nathan. Police believe he was killed by two men, who had responded to an ad he posted about a gun for sale. Ian Hogg Selica was reportedly seen at the property, which is located about 28 miles from where it was first found following Ian's disappearance. The car was found abandoned for a second time six days after Rosson's murder and has been forensically linked to the case. Despite the lack of a body in Ian's case, investigators believe he was also killed and that his body was dumped in the Tweed River during the early morning hours when witnesses reported hearing a gunshot in the area. Police also strongly suspect that the murders of Hogg and Rosson were committed by the same perpetrators, but that the victims did not know each other and were not involved in criminal activity. In October 2023, police spokesperson Adam Bennett announced the offer of a $1 million reward in exchange for information that helps crack the cases. He appealed specifically to anyone who knew Hogg, who he described as an extremely private person, as well as members of the LBGTQ community. Authorities also acknowledged that they had raided a property and were questioning a 56-year-old man in connection with the case, but declined to identify him or offer any more details. Now they're relying on members of the public to come forward with the details they need in order to bring long-awaited justice to the killers. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. Number 1. The Disappearance of Sharon Fulton 39-year-old mother of four Sharon Fulton was last seen alive in March 1986 at a train station in East Perth on her way to meet with friends for lunch. She never arrived at the restaurant and hasn't been seen or heard from since. Sharon's husband, Maxwell Robert Fulton, reported her missing four days after he last saw her. No trace of the woman has ever been found despite extensive media coverage of the case and extensive search efforts. Police even dug up the Fulton's yard after a friend noticed the landscaping had changed, but they failed to find Sharon's body. They also questioned Maxwell, who denied any knowledge of what happened to his wife, despite friends claiming that the marriage was volatile. Two years after Sharon went missing, Fulton was convicted of fraud for forging her name on a loan application. In 1993, seven years after Sharon's disappearance, her husband asked the court to legally declare her dead. According to authorities, Fulton told the judge that the only asset at stake was a $120,000 life insurance policy which had been taken out a month before his wife of 19 years vanished. The judge denied the request, but Fulton's attempts to have Sharon declare dead succeeded two years later, and the life insurance settlement was paid out. During an inquest hearing in 2022, it was revealed that Sharon feared Fulton was going to kill her in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. She had reportedly opened up to a psychiatrist and some friends about how she was seriously considering leaving her husband 
due to his alleged abuse. Sharon's stepmother testified that shortly before her disappearance, Sharon had mentioned her suspicion that Fulton was paying someone to harm her. Best friend Narelle Harrison said that Sharon was terrified to go home at the end of a visit the day before she vanished. But Narelle's repeated attempts to persuade Sharon to leave her husband failed. She and others who knew Sharon insisted that she would never leave her kids behind, which is one of the reasons authorities believe she was murdered, despite having never found her remains. In 2023, authorities offered a $1 million reward for information leading to a conviction in the case. Several months later, Fulton, who now goes by the name Raymond Reddington, was charged with Sharon's murder. The 77-year-old's arrest came after investigators revisited the case and spoke with the couple's children, who all said they wanted to know what happened to their mother. Reddington continues to maintain his innocence and reportedly plans to fight the case. 7. Jealous Boyfriend Law enforcement in Bogota, Colombia is accusing an American named John Poulos of killing 23-year-old Colombian DJ Valentina Tres Palacios. In the 2019 Colombian Dance Awards, Tres Palacios received the Breakout DJ of the Year Award. She was starting to become quite the popular DJ amongst locals, and her future was looking bright. It was determined that the Texas resident, Poulos, who fled to Panama after the murder, was trying to escape to Istanbul. The investigation's ongoing, and at this point, Poulos, the victim's boyfriend, is the primary suspect. Authorities in the area are currently holding Poulos responsible for Tres Palacios' murder thanks to jealousy of her success and many suitors. Tres Palacios' body was placed in a suitcase and buried in the bottom of a trash can. Also, the suspect is said to have thrown Tres Palacios' body in the trunk of his vehicle. This is supported by unsettling footage that was captured of what looks like Poulos. At that point, Valentina was already in the suitcase wrapped up in a towel. According to reports, the pair were considering moving in with each other after being together for only eight months. But that never happened since Poulos actually lived in the United States with a wife and three children. On top of that, he was old enough to be Valentina's father. 6. Disappearance of Matthew Mullaney In 2003, Matthew Mullaney enrolled at Connecticut's Fairfield University. He left on January 11, 2003 for a semester-long study abroad program in Florence, Italy's Angel Academy of Art. February 1, 2003 was the last time he was ever seen. At the time, he was spending time with his friends at the Lion's Fountain, laughing and talking. It was reported that he was not intoxicated when he left at 2.30 a.m. During his travels, Mullaney kept in close contact with his family and friends almost daily through emails and phone calls. According to him, he was working hard on his education and was really enjoying his time in Florence. Because of this, his family was confused when he suddenly stopped reaching out. After that night, Matthew hasn't used his credit card or his prepaid phone cards to make overseas calls. When he disappeared, he was still in possession of his wallet, which had his health insurance card and Massachusetts state driver's license. Interestingly, his passport was left behind with the rest of his things in his apartment. There have been several possible sightings of Matthew across Europe since he officially went missing. Some witnesses claim to have seen him on a train heading from Dover to London, on a ferry from Wales to Dublin, in Galway, Ireland, and in Bologna, Italy. But none of these sightings have been confirmed, and he hasn't been found. Some of the witnesses say that the man who they believe was Matthew looked thin, unkempt, and sick. The Charlie Project is profiling Matthew's story, despite the fact that he vanished in Europe since he's an American citizen. Police in Ireland and the Netherlands are still looking into his disappearance, so Matthew's case is currently open and unsolved. 5. Stephen Sodloff In August 2013, an American journalist named Stephen Sodloff was kidnapped in Syria. He was a freelancer who had written for several major publications, including Time magazine, and had even covered conflicts in the Middle East for years. Mr. Sotloff identified himself as a stand-up philosopher from Miami on his Twitter, which was last used on August 3, 2013. He also mentioned how he loves the Miami Heat basketball team while tweeting about current events in Syria, Libya, Egypt, and Turkey. He frequently concentrated on the human aspect of the overseas crisis, 
writing in early 2013 about the hardships displaced Syrian citizens face who were battling without food or shelter. In 2012, Mr. Sotloff reported from Libya and recounted the events of the night the American embassy in Benghazi when it was attacked. On September 2, 2014, a video was released by the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria (ISIS) showing the horrific murder of Stephen Sotloff. The video was similar to the one released a few weeks before the murder of Sotloff that showed the beheading of American journalist James Foley. This clip showed Sotloff dressing in an orange jumpsuit and kneeling somewhere in the desert. A masked ISIS militant then read a statement condemning the United States and its policies in the Middle East before taking the hostage's life. The killing of Sotloff was widely condemned by leaders around the world who expressed their horror at the brutality of the act. President Barack Obama issued a statement calling the murder a horrific act of violence and vowed to get justice. Sodloff's family also issued a statement saying they were grieving privately and that their son had devoted his life to portraying the suffering of people in war zones and was ultimately martyred for his courage and selflessness. They also thanked those who were working hard to secure his release and urged the world to continue fighting against ISIS. The death of Stephen Sodloff, along with several other high-profile attacks by ISIS, brought renewed attention to the threat posed by the terrorist group and the conflict in Syria. It also raised questions about the safety of journalists working overseas and the need for greater protection for those who put themselves at risk to report on important stories. 4. Brittany Griner Brittany Griner is a center player for the Phoenix Mercury and a two-time gold medalist for Team USA in the Olympics. Since 2015, Griner has spent the WNBA offseason playing basketball with a Russian team called UMMC Ekaterinburg. Around half of the 144 players in the WNBA compete overseas during the state's offseason. Some WNBA players even brought their skills to Russia for the Winter 22 season. Brittany was taken into custody by Russian police on February 17, 2022, after taking a flight from New York to Russia. Authorities launched a criminal investigation after claiming Griner had vapes carrying cannabis oil in her luggage. The four-week-long Griner trial started in July 2022. According to her testimony, she didn't mean to break the law. The guilty verdict was declared by a Russian judge, and she was given a nine-year Russian prison sentence. In December 2022, after months of rumors, Griner was released by Russia in exchange for Viktor Bout, a Russian arms dealer that the US had in custody. According to United States President Joe Biden, the release of Britney was something they were working toward every day. After she got home to American soil, Griner shared her thoughts by saying, it feels good to be home online. What about Paul Whelan is a question many people asked as some were excited about the release of Britney. He is another current American prisoner in Russia and a former U.S. Marine. President Biden has promised to keep fighting to bring him home despite the Kremlin's refusal to release him. Brittany said that she will use her platform to support the administrator during these initiatives. She's concentrating on rejoining the basketball world. Despite the fact that Griner's a free agent, she claims she'll play for Phoenix Mercury when the season starts in May 2023. Britney returned home after almost a year. Now that she's returned to the US, there are growing discussions on the safety of athletes and repatriating other Americans who've been jailed overseas. 3. Otto Warmbier Otto Warmbier was an American college student who died in 2017 after being tortured in North Korea for over a year. In 2015, he was accused of stealing a propaganda poster from his hotel during a tour of the country. He was then sentenced to 15 years of hard labor, but his health declined rapidly and he fell into a coma after his trial. He was released on humanitarian grounds in June 2017, but he died six days later in his hometown of Cincinnati, Ohio. From the beginning, North Korea stood by their statement of never mistreating Mr. Wombia in any way. They claimed that he contracted modulism while in prison, but American doctors never found any evidence of this. Otto's mum, on the other hand, feels differently. When she was reunited with her son, he was not the same. 
He was covered in scars, had broken limbs, a shaved head, and seemed as if he'd broken teeth. Mrs. Warmbier believes her son was tortured, and he was only released because they didn't want him to die on their soil. A medical assessment found no evidence of beatings on Warmbier, despite the fact that he collapsed due to a possible cardiac arrest, which may have caused him to lose blood and oxygen to his brain and put him in a coma. Warmbier's case marked international condemnations of North Korea's human rights violations. His parents sued the North Korean government for wrongful death and won $501 million in damages, which they've not yet been able to collect. They also criticized former President Donald Trump for siding with Kim Jong-un and absolving him of responsibility for their son. They urged other Americans not to travel to North Korea, calling it a terrorist state. Warmbier was born on December 12, 1994, as the oldest of three children. He was a bright and popular student who graduated salutatorian of his high school and attended the University of Virginia for commerce and economics. He also did an exchange program at the London School of Economics. He had a passion for travel and wanted to learn about different cultures and people. Warmbier was described as a warm, kind, and curious person who loved life. 2. Four Americans Kidnapped, Killed in Mexico Four Americans went to Mexico on March 3, 2023 for medical attention, but instead they got caught in a gunfight and were taken hostage by armed men. According to a statement released by the FBI, they were attacked immediately after they got to Matamoros from South Carolina. Matamoros is at the southernmost point of Texas and close to the Gulf Coast. It's reported that they were driving a white minivan with North Carolina plates. Latavia Tay McGee, Shahid Woodard, Eric James Williams, and Zindel Brown were the victims. Two of them were found dead, and two were rescued by Mexican authorities four days later. According to Tamaulipas's Attorney General, Irving Barrios, there was a misunderstanding, and the Americans were not specifically targeted. A source familiar with the case told ABC News that the kidnappers probably assumed the Americans were rival human traffickers. The kidnappers allegedly belonged to the Gulf Cartel, a powerful drug trafficking organization in the region. On March 10, 2023, five alleged cartel members were arrested and charged for the aggravated kidnapping and murder. The two survivors, Williams and McGee, were found in a wooden house on the outskirts of Matamoros on March 7. One of the deceased was also located inside the house, and the other was found outside. One of them was wearing a surgical robe during the discovery. Williams and McGee are now back in the US and have spoken out about their nightmare. They said they were beaten, tortured, and threatened with death. They also said they prayed and sang gospel songs to keep their hopes up. The victims expressed their gratitude to Mexican authorities for rescuing them and their grief for those who didn't make it. They also warned others not to visit Mexico for cheap medical procedures like they did. 1. Bakari Henderson In 2017, Bakari Henderson, a 22-year-old American tourist, was killed by a mob in Greece over a selfie with a waitress. He was a college graduate from Texas who traveled to Zakynthos to launch his clothing line, Bakari Luxury Sportswear. He was beaten to death in the street after being chased out of a bar by a local criminal gang. His death sparked international outrage and calls for justice. The original verdicts didn't suit the ferocity of the attack, according to his relatives, who traveled to Greece for the two trials. In 2018, six men were convicted of grievous assault for Henderson's death, not murder. They received sentences ranging anywhere from 5 to 15 years in prison. A Greek prosecutor appealed the verdict and sought a retrial on murder charges, which could actually carry a life sentence. On February 21, 2022, the original convictions of the six men were upheld when a Greek court rejected the request to increase the penalties. Five of the men had already served their prison terms for assault convictions, had their sentences left unchanged as a result of the ruling. The court shortened the sentence of the sixth suspect, who had previously received a harsher punishment. Since their son's passing, Phil and Joe Henderson have been tirelessly seeking justice for him. Along with continuing his clothing business, which Amazon has now taken up, 
they've also created a foundation in his honor and drawn inspiration from his artwork and journal entries. Thanks for watching. Would you rather encounter a raging kangaroo or a venomous spider during an Australian vacation? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. See you soon. Bye.